All right. Good morning, Finland, and good afternoon, Australia. I'd like to welcome you all to follow this webinar on learning analytics. My name is Jonas Pesonen, and I work as a PhD candidate at the University of Helsinki and also as a data analytics consultant for multiple universities here in Finland. Good for morning, Finland and Australia. It's fantastic to have so many people interested and in working with learning analytics today in this webinar with us. My name is Anne Silvola and I work as PhD candidate uh, at University of Oulu and in the National Learning Analytics Project called Analytics AI. And as our guest, uh, keynote speaker, Professor Abelario Pardo from University of South Australia. Welcome, Abelario. How is it in Australia? <laughs> Uh, very good. We are uh, now at 3.35 in the afternoon on our Wednesday and we are slowly uh, inching towards uh, winter in here, but it's still good. Yeah, we are approaching summer in here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so first, a little bit of background related to this webinar. Uh, last August, uh, University of Helsinki arranged a conference on educational assessment in Helsinki with a special focus on learning analytics. And there I met uh, Dragan Gasevik, a professor of learning analytics at Monash University, and also a former president of Society for Learning Analytics Research, who held there a keynote speech. And what was really interesting to me in the keynote was this uh, concept of uh, personalized feedback at scale. And after the keynote, I asked Dragan more about the topic, and he introduced me to this software called OnTask. Yes, so this on task is something that our keynote speaker today is going to talk about. Yes, indeed. And a few months ago, in the first week of March, I traveled to Arizona, USA for a learning analytics and knowledge conference. And there I attended a workshop called Supporting Feedback Processes at Scale with On Task and hosted by Apple, Professor Apollario Pardo. And it was a really interesting workshop. Thank you, Apollario. Uh, I started thinking that this would be of interest to Finnish learning analytics professionals and then I asked Apollario if he could be av available to keep an online presentation to my Finnish colleagues and here we are now. Seems like you have quite a few colleagues, almost 200. <laughs> yeah, it seems that the Finnish learning analytics community is growing really rapidly. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the actual program. Uh, this morning, we will have a short presentation about the state of learning analytics in Finland by Anni, then followed by Professor Abelario Pardo's keynote and a Q&A session. And finally, I will talk about Finland as a part of global learning analytics community. And regarding the Q&A part, uh, we will now demonstrate to you how to use the Q&A functionality inside Zoom. So you should all have questions and answers button in your Zoom window and pressing it opens up a window where you can post your questions and upload questions posted by others. And now could someone, for example, Kaisa post a sample question that we could show how this works. I know there are people in the next room to me who are uh, testing also this Q&A functionality. So let, let's have a test sample question there. Okay, we have uh, multiple sample questions. And now you can uh, test upvoting, clicking on the thumb icon there so you can see how, how this works. All right, seems like you found the uh, upvoting functionality. So let's move on to the first presentation. So first up, Anni Silvola from University of Oulu and an overview of learning analytics development in Finland. Okay, thank you, Jonas. <clears throat> so do you now, Jonas, see the title slide of my presentation? Yes. Okay. So the aim of my presentation is shortly provide insights about the current situation of learning analytics research and development in Finland. Uh, I will first present a short overview of the current projects and national collaboration on developing learning analytics framework development. 
After that, I will shortly present my thoughts about the potential of Finnish research in the fields of educational psychology and learning analytics. Finally, there will be uh, three examples of current learning analytics projects that will be presented with the help of Hanna Teras from Tampere University of Applied Sciences and Tommy Kärkkäinen from University of Jyväskylä. Uh, so, um, I, I personally hope that this webinar will bring out some new thoughts for all of us, that what kind of strengths and opportunities uh, our country has for the field of learning analytics research and for the international collaboration. Okay, so short overview of current learning analytics project and research in Finland. Mm, as being a small country, we have a lot going on in the field of learning analytics right now. Finnish government has funded national projects where learning analytics is developed in educational institutions. In addition, uh, there are quite a few other national development project focusing on technology enhanced learning and learning analytics from different perspectives. Uh, and they all kind of form an entity where different parts are developed, but they can all be like seen to form a learning analytics path together. <coughs> um, most of the projects are focusing on higher education for now, but there are some projects that are done in vocational education and second degree studies too. Uh, Ministry of Education and Culture and their learning analytics section have listed 12 different projects uh, ongoing with learning analytics research and five different research groups of Finnish universities where learning analytics is especially developed. Uh, similarly, we have uh, a lot of uh, practical development in e uh, educational institutions for example, these uh, strategic leadership tools, uh, which provide predictive information about students and uh, future, future directions for decision makers in institutional level. Uh, Power by BI, for example, is already in use in several institutions. Uh, in, in addition, we also have these smaller local trials and practical development in educational institutions that is not even everything uh, reported or uh, documented so well. But for example, available learning analytics plugins in Moodle have been tried and used in different ways in different educational institutions. Oh. Okay. And in this slide, from the picture below the text, we can see examples of learning analytics projects that are ongoing that take their places in different phases of educational path or educational systems. As, uh, learning analytics tools are developed in all the levels of educational system already. Uh, national collaboration on developing educational data architecture and framework for learning analytics data is important. It's a grounding work that improves our possibilities to use, use uh, student data systematically throughout the educational paths of learners. It also enables us to improve a variety of learning analytic solutions for different levels and also that to support educational work among different stakeholder levels of learning analytics. Uh, similar grounding work with national data architecture framework has been done already in other European countries like in Great Britain, which is a bit further ahead of us already. But in Finland, especially the current development of learner registers called Koski and Virta helps a lot with improving learning analytics uh, student paths in Finland. Uh, also, each individual will have their own learner ID that helps the mobility of learners in, in between educational institutions but it also helps to combine educational data regarding uh, individual learner. Also, uh, we have a national coordination of ethical and legal issues conducted by this uh, uh, learning analytics group under Ministry of Education and Culture, uh, which also improves our opportunities to, 
to improve sustainable and responsible use of educational data. Also, for this work, some frameworks are already available in other European countries, such as in Netherlands, and this work has also been used to support the development in Finnish context. Okay, so for me personally, uh, uh, the interesting topic in learning analytics is to how could we actually use our understanding of of learner learning processes and learning better and combine it with uh, current learning analytics development. Uh, in our country, we have a long history with the research of how learning occurs in different contexts and in, with different people, uh, which gives us a strong theoretical basis to improve innovative learning analytics solutions that actually support learners. Accordingly, we have long traditions in pedagogical design and researching how learning can be supported in different contexts. Uh, but still, uh, we need new kind of interdisciplinary thinking and innovations of how to combine this uh, more and less uh, traditional educational research with new technical solutions and how to develop develop existing digital systems in a way that all this existing knowledge will be used in new ways. We need co-development with technical fields and, and also collaboration with people from other fields that know our legal questions well, so that we also set sustainable and ethical ways to use learning analytics. And here is the first example of learning analytics project where I'm currently, currently working in right now myself. It's called Analytics I and it's one of the national government funded projects of learning analytics in Finland. Uh, our project has uh, seven partner universities from Finland and we have a, a university study path perspective for learning analytics. It means that we try to develop ways to provide students with guiding information that helps them to develop themselves as learners, but also to develop tools for academic guidance that would help the guide, uh, for example, the mm, teacher tutor and the student to collaborate together with planning and monitoring the study progress of the student. We also develop views for faculty and degree program leaders that help them to improve uh, educational paths of students. And also developing uh, views for institution administration that help them to ma make uh, informed decisions and manage the university from perspective of learning. Next, I will ask if Hanna Teras is now online in this. Uh, I believe not. Uh, so uh, you can briefly okay. tell about the APA project, but then we'll move on. Okay, so I will shortly tell oh, about. Oh, there is uh, Mel Tank. Is it? Okay. There. Let's see if it works. Is your live at Tank? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello, <Hi>. Hannah. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion. Where uh, I and my my husband Marco are hey. are working in the same project, and we're actually sharing his. Uh, his computer and we are uh, sitting at our lounge at the moment. <laughs> so. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. So, it's, so a minute of you about the APA project. Yeah. Yes. So um, APA, uh, which is an abbreviation from Finnish words that mean um, uh, better learning for 
uh, universities of applied sciences is uh, is an 11 universities consortium in finland and our our focus is uh, more on the pedagogical side of the use of learning analytics so we are focusing on the development and testing of uh, learning analytics driven pedagogical interventions in different degree programs in different types of learning environments and uh, as I said, we are working together with uh, with eleven universities in Finland from all parts of the country, and um, we are uh, we are mostly focusing on uh, on the micro and uh, and uh, partly also on the meso level of learning analytics, and just a little bit on on the, the broader institutional decision making level. So we are more um, drilling into the the nuts and bolts of of the course level. We're working together with uh, with uh, um, teachers in redesigning the uh, the courses and units to uh, to test and implement uh, learning analytics based solutions and uh, and evaluate those different solutions. So we're currently at the stage where we're designing the pilots, which will commence, um, uh, finish fall, Australian spring, and, and continue for next year. So we also have a, um, a website where you can read more. You can see it on the left-hand side of the screen. That's our, um, our Facebook and uh, Twitter and um, our website. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Annie. And now we'll uh, move along uh, to the keynote presentation. So next I have the privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Abelario Pardo is a professor and dean academic at the Division of Information Technology, Engineering and the Environment at the University of South, South Australia. His work examines the areas of learning analytics, personalized active learning, and technology for student support. And since March this year, he's also the president of a Society of Learning Analytics Research. Thank you, Jonas. Um, I guess the first question that I have is everybody can see the slides and not the author notes, everything correct? All right. Yes. Excellent. Well, um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank both uh, Jonas and Annie, the organizers of this event, for giving me the opportunity to talk to so many people and so many researchers in the area of learning analytics. It is very exciting for me to uh, be able to reach out to so many of you in, in such an um, important time for our discipline, but also um, in such a convenient channel. Um, for those of you that just uh, recently joined, um, I'm broadcasting or I'm presenting from Adelaide. Uh, beautiful uh, city in the center, south center of uh, Australia. It's now almost four o'clock here in the afternoon. So let me just uh, tell you very quickly a little bit of background of uh, what I'm coming from and what we're doing. I'm a member, within the university, I'm a member of this uh, research center that we call C3L. It's the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning. And the type of things that we are um, studying is basically to explore how human and artificial cognition under and to understand the knowledge processes. The other thing that is very important for our research group is we are highly practical and we put a lot of emphasis on trying to seek impact. And this is very much relevant to the type of things we are uh, about to discuss now. Uh, the center is located here at the University of South Australia and is currently directed by Professor George Siemens with the help also of Professor Shane Dawson, two of the initial figures that have started uh, the area of learning analytics. Very quickly, I'm going to be trying to cover four topics today in our, in our conversation. The first one is a little bit of a very quick understanding or, or, or landscape description about data in the area of education, because it's a little bit tricky to map what is currently existing in other disciplines to our field of education. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how is uh, the education field approaching its relationship with data. And I'd like to tease out or unpack a little bit who is supporting who, because most of the scenarios we see data-driven the, the reasoning, and we think there should be the other way around. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I call the last mile problem, which is, okay, if we have powerful data analysis tools, how can, I, how can we assure that instructors make the most out of them? And this is what I call the last mile problem. 
And finally, I'm going to describe a little bit our ideas in this tool that we call on task that Annie and uh, Jonas already mentioned. So let's talk very quickly about data and education. Unfortunately, and, and as you can see, this is a, an article that is already four years old. Um, every, pretty much every day in the news, we see um, information about how data is changing everything, right? Uh, this is an example I took from a newspaper about uh, the analytics in sports and how sports are being reshaped by that. But I think we can have the same example in medicine, in traffic control, smart cities, you name it. There is always something going on that reminds us how important data is. In the context of education, though, I'd like to start narrowing it down a little bit and, and explore a little bit the, the formal definition we typically go around. For us, learning analytics is a collection of processes or a, or a collection of techniques that is going to allow us to collect, analyze, and report data about learners and their context. And the purpose of the goal is increasing our understanding, because I think we can agree that learning is a fairly complex process, but also try to improve it, try to optimize, try to uh, provide support to both the students, the instructor, or anyone taking part on that, on that experience. As Jonas mentioned briefly, um, we do have an international society that was created for the purpose of supporting learning analytics research. It's called SOLAR. Um, I encourage you to check the web page at the bottom in there. Perhaps one of the most important things is a society that is promoting a few events. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the next one in a second. But it's also committed to um, equality. It's also committed to open access to research. And it's committed to promoting an open discussion of the field. So we have a few things like, for example, a journal that is about to be indexed that is um, uh, open access. Uh, we published a handbook of learning analytics that is also published in open content or, or creative commons. And the other thing I wanted you to point out is that our next event, the 10th edition of the Learning Analytics and Knowledge, is happening basically in your back door or in your back uh, garden. It's in Frankfurt. It's coming up on the 23rd to 27th of March. And we're about to uh, push out the call for paper. So I encourage you to take a look at that page and, and see if you want to participate. It would be fantastic to increase the representation of Finnish researchers and practitioners. And it's actually an event which I think you will find very, very uh, interesting. So let's move on a little bit about the topics we want to uh, cover. My approach to learning analytics is usually try to um, fill the gaps, basically. We are excited about data. Uh, I think the mediation of technology in learning, in learning experiences is increasing. And that means we all know that technology gives us a lot of data. But over the last few years, we're still very far away, or we're still trying to articulate a robust connection between data and learning. And I've had some conversations that, uh, with people that tell me, yeah, we have a lot of data. So what? I mean, this is very complex. How do we, how do we situate all these things? And one of the things that is very quickly coming to, to my mind is that we are not in the same situation as the way data is managed by Google or Facebook. We're not, uh, we're not about um, social platforms. It's about learning. It's about the very personal process. Um, my colleagues, uh, Shane Dawson, Dragon Gasevich, and George Siemens, published a very interesting paper uh, uh, a few months ago, or actually a few years ago, in which they try to bring back the focus on learning for learning analytics. So it's not so much about data and sophisticated predictive models. The processes should start from the learning process. And this is something very important I'm going to keep going back. The reason why I point this out is because over the last few years, we detected a few challenges, a few hurdles when we try to connect these two worlds. Um, analytic methods are advancing a lot. Predictive models are present. But when we try to deploy them on learning environments, it is challenging. And the reason why it's challenging is because we have a translation problem. We are struggling to translate all the advantages of data analytics into concrete steps and concrete actions in learning environments. I came across this article, um, which is already uh, a few years old, trying to point out why uh, researchers struggle with, um, sorry, why practitioners, teachers in this case, struggle to translate or to apply results in research. And I think this is very relevant. And we have to try to avoid the danger of having the research community advancing very quickly but not having then an uptake or a translation of those contributions into practical terms. And I think this is very important. Another inter interesting piece of the landscape is that we begin to see more and more opinions. This is a recent one that was published in the magazine Wired a few days ago about the need to scale down the expectation of artificial intelligence and still of thinking in terms of replacing 
natural intelligence or human intelligence, we need to start thinking about enhancing intelligence, how all these algorithms and techniques can be embedded and contribute substantially to already existing contexts, and learning would be one of them. So under this umbrella, and under these premises of being mindful and respectful about what is the best way to integrate existing learning analytics technologies with existing practices that are already working and that are already doing um, a lot of uh, positive impact, having a lot of positive impact in students. I'd like to move on and start um, unpacking a little bit why are we struggling with this capitalization of potential with learning analytics. So the typical scenario, is not always the case, but it's very frequent. Uh, when I approach uh, someone that is discussing or promoting the use of learning analytics is in this direction that I'm showing in the screen. It's coming from the data. And it's usually, unfortunately, starting the conversation always, oh, we have a lot of data. And the conversation typically goes like that. This is the type of information that is collected by our platforms. Large amounts of data, a lot of uh, events, a lot of uh, click streams. We can parse these things, um, analyze its content, and then ultimately, we pass it through some black magic box, and we report some data, and perhaps the best way to do it is through dashboards. Again, this is an oversimplification. I'm not, I'm not saying that all the learning analytics initiatives are like that, but they typically start being discussed from the data. Now, this is a very good example to reflect a little bit. The dashboards are okay, but they are okay for certain contexts. For learning, we need something a bit more powerful. We need something that is much more contextualized. Dashboards are um, dazzling for certain type of people, but for day-to-day -day practitioners, day-to-day -day instructors, they sometimes need a little bit more. They need much more powerful insights. And if we bring the students into the equation, if we want to provide the students with support and with help, then dashboards don't seem to be that uh, effective. Typically, when we work with dashboards and we synthesize a lot of data there, that density of information is very high. And sometimes, the higher the density, the more expertise is required to understand what is being shown. So what I'm proposing is, Looking at the problem the other way around, looking at the problem first from the learning design. So rather than becoming very quickly obsessed with the amount of data we have in our fingertips, hypothetically speaking, I'd like to start focusing more from the learning design and go back to basics and ask ourselves the type of questions that instructors have been asking themselves for years. We have very good instructors right now uh, supervising learning experiences. And they basically start thinking, OK, what kind of strategies are the most effective one for my students? What kind of uh, theories can I consider? What kind of aspects of learning can I promote? And these are the first questions that need to point us in the right direction. So let me give you an example. Rather than uh, focusing on the amount of data that is given to me by a video platform or by a collection of videos that I put online, why don't we go back and say, what would be the best way to use videos pedagogically? How does it make sense to use videos in my context? Does it make sense or not? What kind of a scaffolding? What kind of a structure do I put around the videos? So let's say, for example, that we agree that our students would benefit from using videos, but not just videos. We want to go and promote engagement. We're going to go and promote reflection, which are aspects that are very powerful. And this discussion is the one that says, all right, um, as an instructor, I decide to include videos with annotations. So this is the first step. You see, we're not thinking in terms of data. We're thinking in terms of the learning design and what it makes sense from the point of view of my design. Now let's bring it closer to data. Let's suppose that we capture a certain amount of information that is telling us that students fit in four profiles. And these are just some examples. Suppose that we have information that tells us that a learner read the to-do list some document, engaged with the videos, create several annotations, and then went back and ticked some items on that to-do list. And this is happening all in week two of our experience. So this would be an interesting information. At least we see that, our, that a student from, what, from which this information is captured um, seems to be engaged. Suppose we have another scenario. A learn played one single video, no annotations were created, nothing interaction with the to-do list, and this happened in week two, and nothing has happened so far. So this is another interesting example. And you see what I'm trying to get to this. We are beginning to have information that allows us to personalize the type of suggestions we would tell that student. Third scenario, the learner played one video, read the to-do list, it is for the first time, though, and they, no annotations, but this thing happened during week three, so it's a bit later than the previous one. Or a fourth scenario, the learner played all the videos, he played it for the fifth time, keeps going back to those videos, reviewed the to-do list several times, added annotations. So you see, once we 
decided to include certain affordances in our learn design, then we still we start differentiating different ways of how students engage with those affordances. And this is the prelude then to start looking at data. And now what I'm trying to highlight with this is that the data that you're seeing there, it is actually not just given to us out of the blue, it should be data that connects with the scenario we just described. We would like to see how many times the video was played, how many annotations, how many times do they uh, access the to-do list, and all these things are because we initially decided that it was a very good activity or, a, or an activity that made sense from the point of view of the design. So basically what I'm proposing is going the other way around. Starting with the design, starting putting the emphasis on the type of things that matter, understanding how memory and learning works, um, identifying useful techniques for study, um, identifying how can we support students to help them monitor themselves, um, perhaps tell the students about existing biases. In other words, things or ideas or design elements that are already being used in the day-to-day -day operations. What I'm proposing is start the discussion from those and then walk your way back to the data rather than just say, okay, we have a lot of data. We need to do something about learning analytics. Um, let's see what kind of things we can do. So if we try to turn around the problem like this, we still have a little bit of an issue here. And this is what I call the last mile problem. The last mile problem is actually an analogy or a term that is used in, uh, in logistics, which is basically dealing with how do you bring uh, assets or goods to the doorstep of your customer. In this case, it's not the customer. The translation here is how do we make the most or how do we make possible so that um, all instructors make use or make the best use of the data. So let me take it back to the previous context. Once you have decided that your learning design has certain elements, how can we offer you the type of data and the type of techniques that allow you to take actions? And this is the crucial part. What we have seen so far is a lot of initiatives that put the focus on creating the predictive models, uh, creating dashboards, analyzing patterns, analyzing success rates. All of this is about the analytics method. We would like to push it further and say, okay, what kind of actions will we derive from those? And this is one journey that we've been exploring over the last few years. And, um, and it's a little bit at the heart of the effort to, that derived in the, the tool on task that was mentioned before. So let me take it all the way back and, and let's go to psychology. And the psychologists have been, studying, have been studying for quite a while how humans make decisions and what kind of decision processes we go through. And more importantly, how can we promote good decisions or making good choices? And the psychologists already identified that there is a very strong correlation when we promote three elements. People make good decisions, and this is referring to students. The students would make good decisions when they have experience, which is something that they probably are trying to acquire when they have good information, and this is something we need to put emphasis on our design, but most importantly, when people receive prompt feedback. So this points to one crucial element that we identify, one of many, okay, this is just one aspect of education that would be very relevant, which is if we want to support our students, how about we explore how we give them feedback because it would be at the heart of their decision-making process, and decision-making connects with engagement, connect with self-regulation, connect with so many aspects that promote learning, that is probably a very good focal point. There is quite a lot of research in the literature about the effect of feedback. And it is fairly unanimous, unanimously identified as one of the aspects that has the highest potential to have a positive impact. And I don't think anybody would be surprised about it, especially the people that are in invested or, or practicing learning or instruction regularly. We just know it is very uh, effective, but at the same time, it's very challenging. The definition I'd like you to, to share with you uh, regarding feedback is basically as a process, not necessarily as something we provide. It's more as a process, something that occurs. And our aim is to create a positive influence, a positive influence on how the students engage, how to improve, but also increase their self-evaluation capacity. So I guess what we're trying to um, identify here is if we have a very powerful aspect of the educational experience that seems to be having high potential for impact, can we connect now data with the provision of feedback? A little bit more information. Um, the people involved in educational psychology not only have identified feedback as having a lot of potential, but some of them have even gone farther and claiming that unless you engage in feedback, there is no learning happening. So there are 
currents and, and trends out there that put a lot of emphasis on feedback as one of the essential pieces. Now, some of you may be thinking, yep, we already know that. Uh, in fact, in my day-to-day -day operations or in my day-to-day -day, um, activities, I do have uh, to provide a lot of feedback. I do give a lot of importance to feedback. What is new? So what we're trying to connect here are the two ends of this conversation we've had so far. On one hand, we have quite a lot of feedback that could potentially tell us detailed information about those activities and those affordances that you decided to include in your design. But at the same time, you are the one that know how to provide this feedback. So our approach is captured by this picture that I'm showing you here. We would like to see if we can enhance or provide the idea of a conceptual exoskeleton. And this is the analogy of the type of hardware that allows you, for example, to lift uh, an object that is very heavy. You wouldn't be able to do it on your own, but you will be able with this exoskeleton. So the analogy here is, is there a possibility to articulate analytics methods such that instructors can use it to provide much more comprehensive feedback, much more complete feedback, much more situated? And is, is it possible to create that in a data-driven environment? So this was the question that we asked ourselves a few years back, and we tried to then unpack um, on a project that uh, led to the creation of this uh, tool that I'm gonna show you uh, immediately called OnTask. So let's move into the example. The idea of OnTask is actually a fairly simple concept. Let me show you the architectural uh, diagram here. The idea is that uh, starting with what we call a table or a matrix or a spreadsheet, that contains information about the students. It could be a very large number of students. And this information, these columns you see there, these are very similar to some of the Excel sheets that I've seen uh, when I interact with academics, right? Uh, for each student, you capture certain information. The slight difference is that that information could be now much more uh, detailed. You could have hundreds and hundreds of columns, something that is provided to you by all these indicators that we have been discussing. Another way to look at it is, you may have students interacting not only with you, you are observing things about them and annotating that in your table, but that table is enhanced or is extended by other platforms, perhaps like the learning management system, or perhaps you have some demographics about your students, or perhaps you have a predictive model. The crucial point is that that table in the center in there is the type of information that academics or instructors are already used to use to provide feedback. So you look at your table and say, oh, look at Chris. Chris is struggling with these points because uh, my indicator seems to suggest that. Or Chris is not engaging with the videos because I don't see any traffic. Or Chris has produced a lot of annotations for those videos. So he or she seems to be engaged in, the, in that type of activity. What we're trying to do is have this matrix or this table as the focal point and start to connect the three elements. The data that is coming to you, the need to provide feedback, but also the need to provide personalized feedback. One of the elements that is very important, important when you provide feedback, and again, every instructor out there can relate to that. When you provide the same suggestion to all the students, they immediately realize that some of them are not the target of that message. If you say, I would recommend you to engage with the videos. Yes, but I'm already doing that. I already did that. So me as a student, I, I get the sense that this message is not addressed to me. So I don't, I don't bother, I don't pay attention. So I guess one of the crucial elements is that this feedback is much more efficient if we personalize, if we talk to the students about their reality, their uh, concepts, their um, specific situations. Now, how do we do that? And again, we use a very simple construct, which is we would like the instructors to try to visualize what would they tell to different students. And then using a very simple construct, which we call an if this, then that, separate different conversations or different paragraphs of different or different bits and pieces from the different type of a student. So this is an example. Suppose that a student uh, played one video, did not create any annotations, didn't read the to-do list in week two. So we would like to capture that as a condition. If the indicators are equal to zero, the uh, video play in week two is equal to zero, and the annotations in week two are equal to zero, and the read to-do list is equal to zero, and then in there, if that is the case, I would write a specific test, a text that applies only to those students and will be shown only to those students that comply with that property. If this, then I would tell, it would be good for you to check the videos. It relates to the certain topic we're explaining in class. And we need to do this to tackle certain other challenges ahead of us. Also, I would like you to check the to-do list. So this is the type of conversation snippet that instructors are very good at creating because they are aware of the contextual situation of the design, 
but they are now supported by detailed annotations of, the, of those elements of the design. So this rule, if this then that, is at the heart of on task. So let me give you a quick overview about the type of um, functionality provided by the tool. The first observation I'd like to make is when you enter the tool, we assume that instructors will, help, will manipulate a collection of workflows. A workflow, it's a course, basically. It's a set of actions and a table. The table is the data table, the one that I show you, that contains the information about your students. And the actions are these personalized messages that you're going to send to them. So this is the first screen capture of the platform. What we're trying to show here, forget about the administrative functions because there is always some administrator will take care of things. This is a collection of six workflows that an instructor is manipulating. And you can think of them as courses. You can bundle different courses in uh, different workflows. The workflow, it's basically a table, a data table, and a set of actions. The data table is nothing more or something similar to an Excel sheet. You have columns, you have rows, the columns have some IDs, some emails, names, some indicators, and the platform, of course, allows you to manipulate that table, allows you to create columns, add columns, add rows, or perhaps select only a subset of the table with the views, or perhaps take a look at the dashboard, but that's just for you, the instructor, to manipulate that. Now, next to the table is the important element, which is the set of actions, and this is the collection of actions. If you look at the top menu, it allows you to move between the collection of workflows. Once you open a workflow, it allows you to move between the table and the actions. Now, these actions that I show you in the screen are different types. Currently, the platform supports um, four types of actions. I want you to uh, bring your attention to the ones that are in green that says personalized text, which are the ones that I'm going to see in the example. So for example, in there, we see uh, the last one of the green ones, suggestions about the form. So this is a message to remind the students that haven't visited the forum. This is a very simple message that will just have a condition to identify those students that haven't engaged with the discussion forum and send them a very simple message. Now, this is a very simple example that will complicate a little bit. What I want to see you in there is just a very simple personalized message. We just put the first name in there and the co coordinate of them at the bottom. Where do we get those from? We basically insert what we call a column value, which is the name of the student, and an attribute. Like I said, this is a very simple example. Now, the important thing is that I like to send this email only to a subset of students. How do I do that? I do that using the filter. I create a filter. How do I create a filter? I like to send these students to certain ones that satisfy certain conditions. So I use the filter to select only a subset of the rows on that table. And this is the appearance of the filter. It's basically a condition that says, if the column that states the day online is less or equal to seven, so if I detect low engagement, then these are, this is the condition that is going to determine which students will be considered. So if we go back, as you can see there on the screen, right now, out of my 14 learners in this hypothetical scenario, two of them are the ones that comply with that property, and two of them are the ones that will be considered. Now, this is just one filter that separates those learners that are going to receive the message from those that is not needed. The other important element are the conditions, text conditions. These are conditions that will allow us to turn on or off or enable or disable parts of our email. So let me show you an example of a condition. Suppose that I have students that come from four different groups, and those groups have certain names. Suppose it's called FAS, uh, one is FAS, one is SMED, four groups, and I have a column, that column that you see there that says program, and that column is the one that tells me where is the student in my groups. So suppose that what I want to do is showing or sending different text to the students depending on the group they belong to. This is a much more complex type of email, right? So I will create this condition. The condition said for each of the four groups, those, those are the acronyms, FAS, FEIT, FSCI, and SMED. These are four groups, and I have a column that tells me who belongs to who. I create four conditions. They would appear like that. And then the final part is if I go back to my text, this is a much more complex text. I still have the element of the personalization in there. I still insert the column. But now the most important thing is I can include a paragraph that will appear for everyone. And then, this is the crucial part, a paragraph that appears only for those learners that satisfy one of the four conditions. So instead of an email, what I have here is an email template. And with those emails, what I have is a bit of a mail merge service type of thing in which 
this email will be evaluated for each student based on the condition, on the data that I previously uploaded in the table. And based on that, certain part of that email, certain part of the text will be hidden and certain part of the text will be shown. Now, I think you'll agree with me that this is not exactly the message. This is actually a template. And this template needs to be interpreted. It needs to be interpreted based on the data. We would like to see what is the final appearance of these messages. And this is the purpose of this preview button at the top. Since what you're editing right now is not an email, but a template, we would like now to observe what is the effect of that template over the uh, collection of students. If you click on that button, then the platform renders that email for you. So as you can see at the top, you see that the name has been replaced by the actual name of the student. Next, we have uh, the, common, um, the common paragraph for all the students. And then out of all three or four paragraphs that were in our template, if we go back to our template, and in the template we have one, two, three, four paragraphs depending on the program, only one of them is shown. And in there, I didn't include in detail all the text, but you get the picture. You will include there specific suggestions or specific um, text for that type of a student. The condition for that student can be anything. So right now it's just an example. It's about a program, but it could be depending on the submission, or it could be based on your own observations in the classroom, or it could be something that is a combination of what you have observed and what the student has done in some other platform. I guess the main important thing is, as long as you have data in your table informing you of these uh, different uh, values, then you are in a position to write these conditions. The platform allows you to circle over these personalized messages. Now, if you see at the example, this example is a little bit more complex and it's 500 students. You're not going to cycle over 500 students, but the platform helps you detect anomalies, like for example, an email that would have all the conditions equal to false, just to prevent you from sending something that is empty or meaningless. The platform also shows you the values that have affected this email. So this screen is basically telling you that the email was shaped in that form as you are seeing it right in the screen because the value of the variable program has, is equal to fast. So for someone that is writing about four programs, you very quickly will say, oh yeah, this is the fast email and yeah, it's confirmed by the values in there. So again, this is just the preview. If you close the preview and close the action, the next step you would do is go to the execution of the action. And this is sending the emails. And this is the prelude of the screen before sending the emails. You will get to choose a subject. You will need to tell the platform which column is the one that contains the email address so that we can personalize it. You have the option of, of copying people in that email or blind copying them. And then four additional options that are very interesting. You could take a last look at the emails just in case you want to remove some of them. We give you the option of that extra step. We, you also have the option of receiving a summary email yourself, something that tells you we just sent 500 emails to these students. The platform tries to track the email reading, although this is a little bit uh, tricky because it relies on so many factors that sit outside of the platform, but at least you would have a little bit of a sense of how many students are opening the emails. And one very useful feature is um, you can send the emails and at the same time download a copy of your workflow. It's like you take a picture. So this is the data I had today before I sent these emails. The powerful um, consequence of downloading the snapshot is that if you want to go back in time, suppose that six months later you want to say, oh, I wonder what kind of data I had and what kind of emails I sent, you can always upload that workflow as another workflow in your collection and start browsing about what you did back then. Okay, so this was a very quick introduction. There are a lot of other details in the platform and it has a lot of other functionality, but I just want to focus on the most effective one. So you grasp the idea and then those of you that are interested, I'll be happy to allow for it. So let me conclude. Some of you might be thinking, okay, this is all intuitive, uh, seems to have legs, seems to do this connection between the data and the actions. Uh, you have chosen the feedback. Does it work or not? Uh, we run quite a few experiments, and some of them, um, for most of them, we have more or less the same pattern. In summary, this is one we published a few years back already. Um, when the students uh, receive this type of feedback, they find it helpful. Uh, and we uh, detected a very uh, significant increase on their perception of these uh, feedbacks helpful. And in a contained experiment, naturalistic experiment in a course, we detected a slight increase on uh, academic performance. But again, the details are a little bit specific for that context. It was higher education context. And you can find those details in that publication. One of the things though that we have found consistently is when we talk to the students in focus groups and we ask them, ask them basically two types of questions. Um, how do you feel about these emails and what do you do after you receive these messages? 
And what we try tend to find consistently in most of our stu studies is that students find these emails, um, it make them feel a little bit nervous or anxious or start thinking about things. But most of them, uh, they tell us that they decide to do things, that they, have to ch they decide to change the way they approach things. And this is something that we are in the process of writing and publishing this paper. We are about to submit probably in the next two, three months. But the main idea is that students uh, offer, often um, frame the reception of the emails as something that makes them uncomfortable, but at the same time, it prompts some sort of action, which begs the question, um, how can we handle that appropriately? If you are more interested in the tool, a um, couple of things that probably are worth uh, mentioning is this is a project that um, finished uh, last month, but we still have the, the tool that is open source, that is available for you to to review available so you can check it and we also have demo servers and the demo servers are available to any one of you in fact jonas uh, has already been uh, not only using those demo servers to play with the tool but he also very generously contributed to the translation of the tool or the localization of the tool to finish so um the demo will detect uh the configuration of your server and uh, sorry of your browser and if your browser is uh requesting the pages in a language that we have available in your case will be finnish uh you will be interacting with the tool uh, translated to finnish um it is not entirely perfect mostly because we keep changing a few things but jonas is doing a fantastic job at trying to keep those translation up to speed so let me uh, summarize what we discussed and that way we open the the questions uh, immediately um, from my point of view, I think data in education needs to enhance the current practices. There is potential for that, but we need to take a little bit of a different approach to the problem. And rather than letting the data drive what is happening in the learning, it should be the other way around. It should be the processes and the experts and the instructors that are already doing fantastic things in, in that context. Those would be the ones designing and driving what data needs to be collected and how data needs to support them. Um, I think for me, one of the key issues uh, marrying this presence of data and learning is to focus on actions. And it's not only stopping at, oh, look, yeah, the data is telling us a few interesting things, but try to push what kind of actions, what kind of things would I do different? How my design would be affected by the insights that I'm finding? Um, along those lines, we took the opportunity or we took the decision, made the decision to focus on personalized feedback as one of those actions that we thought it had potential for data support. And as a consequence, we created this paradigm or we created this tool called OnTask. And it's trying to support a very simple task that instructors are already doing, which is mixing their observations. But we try to take it to the next level and say, if you have a large variety of data sets or even a large student cohort, how can you personalize that? And try to um, achieve that balance between personalized, highly contextualized feedback but do it at that scale. If you have 500 students or if you have 500 teachers in a teacher training program, national, uh, national initiative to teach uh, some other people or to support them, how can you personalize that type of reaction or that type of actions based on the data you capture in those contexts? That's all for me. Um, I'll be more than happy to take questions. I see there are some of them already popping up in the list. And I'll hand it over to Jonas and uh, Annie and to see what kind of um, discussion or what kind of activities you want to do next. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Apollo. And now would be the perfect time to write more questions and upvote uh, what you think is the best questions. So while you're uh, writing your questions, I'll, I'll start with a few uh, that we got beforehand, uh, before the webinar. And the first was that do you have any ideas how this tool could be used in uh, courses where students write essays? Okay, there is a fascinating area that is uh, now very uh, active, which is in the area of uh, writing analytics. And I guess my main, um, my main answer to that question would be, if you have such a process, if you have the possibility of collecting uh, statistics or um, indicators about how students write. And that would mean things like, for example, the level of cohesiveness of a text or the level of uh, structure or things like that. Then, like I said, on task is solving the last, the last mile problem, right? It is if you have those indicators, then give it to the instructor and the instructors would be capable of writing these personalized messages. 
Um, capturing data about how students write is challenging, but there are some research initiatives that are already proposing things like that. So I guess my answer would be, it would be complementary to what we are proposing here. If you have those indicators, if you capture that data from your platform, then uploaded it to OnTask, and you would be in an ideal position to start providing students personalized feedback about the way they write. Thank you. Uh, then the next question would be, uh, how could this be uh, used in the context of uh, foreign language uh, writing courses and for example uh, collecting data about common errors for yes, targeted this intervention? This is a very interesting case so and I think it fits perfectly the pattern we've been discussing here and and I'm glad that the question is framed from the point of view of the design right so the context is foreign language learning we have exercises we have data about how students engage with these exercises and the most uh, uh, common mistakes. So it would be ideal to apply it in a way similar to what I just described, which is first, step number one, collect the data about all these events. Second, put it in a way that makes sense to the instructor. And from what you're describing, this seems to be something feasible because you are already talking in terms of the exercises. And then start detecting what would be my suggestion when I observe certain patterns. So for certain exercises, I have very good suggestions if students struggle with that, let me detect those students and send that specific uh, suggestion to those students. I guess the, the element that you need to start considering is how do you personalize things? Instructors are very good at detecting what is not working, but we need to push a bit more and try to go back to the students in a personalized way. So basically talk to Henry or talk to Sarah and tell Sarah or Henry, look at that exercise again. You need to reflect on this. You need to practice that. And it's very relevant for them because they struggle with that. So that's, I think, the element we need to maintain. All right. Then there's uh, one kind of broader question about learning analytics in general. So learning analytics is a hot topic in Finland and the world in general, although it hasn't produced you no know, big breakthrough in education yet in terms of learning outcomes and such. Uh, why do you think this is and what is this big hype then all about? Are investments needed for learning analytics really worth it? Yeah, I think we follow a little bit the, the cycle of hype, right? So we first think that learning analytics is going to solve all the problems, then we realize it's not the case, and then we fall a little bit into despair. Um, I think we need to focus a bit more on the effect on actions for the students. So basically, data is not going to solve your problems. Data is going to be one more resource, one more tool that you have in there. And if used properly, it'll allow you to gain insight and therefore provide better quality to your students. If we think about the overall uh, quality of the student experience, right? Um, ideas like the ones we connected with this project with OnTask, um, they had very good reception from the students. The students appreciated those personalized comments. They had the notion or they had the, the feeling that they had like a coach talking to them. And I think that's a lot of a space that needs to be explored. Some instructors are already doing that, but they cannot usually do it beyond 25, 30, 40 people. What we are proposing here is to use the power of data to see if we can connect directly with actions that are um, suggested to the students or actions in our design that, that have a direct connection with the students. So this is just one idea. There are other ideas like uh, putting them in touch with clubs or putting them in touch with uh, each other or proposing um, effective um, work habits or these type of things. Um, I believe we are in a very good position to start uh, using data to make those decisions. I, I think we need to go beyond the hype. I think we need to abandon this idea that learning analytics is going to behave like Amazon or like Google and it's going to do artificial intelligence magic to our courses. Learning is very complex. It requires sophisticated interaction between among humans and it's going to remain like that. We just need to capitalize or, or um, identify that blending between or intelligence enhancement that like I was mentioned in that article that I show how to blend that so that practitioners, instructors and students make the most out of it. An example that comes to mind, and these are other fields that um, are already dealing with technology, sophisticated technology, medicine or aviation are fields that are already in very close touch with technology and technology is helping them to perform procedures and doing things that were unthinkable before. I think learning needs to follow a little bit that pattern and not remove the human from the conversation. In fact, it's the opposite. The human will gain even more relevance 
but that human has to be supported, properly supported, and the capacity enhanced with this type of technology. I think we need to go in that direction. Thank you. All right, I see that we're having some questions already in the Q&A tool, so uh, Anni, you could uh, start with those. Yes, uh, I will pick those that are now directed for Professor Pardo. And there is the first question would, could be that, uh, what do you think, Professor Pardo, that would be uh, the ideal kind of learning analytics research? And what kind of learning analytics do you think we have in 2030? That's a very good question. For me, the ideal um, learning analytics research should be connected directly with learning. Uh, so rather than, than focusing on how to create the best predictor algorithm for um, some obscure feature of learning, something that is much more connected with actions. Uh, so the, the answer to the previous question, if the context is foreign language learning, uh, what kind of uh, data support do we need to improve that experience? So in 2030, what I envision is a much more contextualized type of research, something that says in the context of um, a student's uh, mastery in presentation skills, th those are the type of uh, data that we are collecting and these are the type of actions that we are providing our students. In the context of, so highly contextualized type of uh, initiatives that are much more connected with impact. That would be my uh, desired view in 2030. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Spain and they ask, uh, uh, from Spanish teacher who asks, is it possible to collect learning data after an already hold course with recorded videos and pictures and how relative information could we get when not following regularly the learning of the participants? Okay, this is a highly uh, contextual question. Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends the amount of technology mediation you have in the experience and it depends how much of that mediation is stored or recorded. Let me give you an example. If it is a Moodle course, Moodle keeps track of certain logs and certain uh, recordings that you can access after you finish the course. Having said that though, you won't have the opportunity to provide any actions, right? Because the course has finished already. Having said that though, there is quite a lot of research on using that data to then um, support or create models that then will help you in the decisions for the following editions of the course. So if it is a course that has several editions and it repeats itself, there is a chance that you can go back to technology and if you're lucky, you will have there a certain amount of data that you can sit comfortably without any pressure and analyze, but use that knowledge or that insight to then promote the repetition of that course for future editions. Thank you. Uh, still uh, questions, uh, there is a person from machine learning background and uh, he wrote, uh, I have a doubt on learning design driven system as opposed to data driven system. I think the former inherently imposes a bias from the teacher rather than understanding the student's style of learning. Uh, <clears throat> what would you say? Okay, let me give you let me give you an example. Um, suppose that you collect these click streams, right? And these click streams are telling you things like uh, video engagement, multiple choice question engagement, page visited, all these things. And you have a fairly comprehensive data set. And you run your algorithms, and you run I don't know some clustering or or perhaps some uh, logistic regression to uh, study certain conditions, and you get your responses, right? Um, you may obtain useful information from that process. In our experience, however, those same algorithms uh, were much more powerful when we started to process the data uh, through steps that we call sense making. And let me give you an idea. So you have video engagement, but it turns out that videos are paired with questions and certain videos are next to certain questions. So you need to have that type of contextual information to say, oh, I'd like to create a new indicator in my data that says, this student is engaging with this topic or this activity because I've detected activity in the video followed by activity in the question. So this video and the, this question go together. Another element that is very relevant is time. Usually uh, learning experiences are orchestrated. So it is very different to have engagement with certain video and questions on week one uh, or in the same week in which it was uh, presented to the students 
or have that engagement on six weeks later or have that engagement regularly over time. This would detect a pattern of revisiting. Now, all that information is depending on the context. If you just listen to your data, your data will tell you only so far because your data is not aware of the context. You have to take your data and you have to shape it and you have to put it in the context of the learning experience. You have to make sure that uh, you pair the right videos with the right questions. You have to make sure that you pair the right activities at the right time for the right purpose. That's when the data starts talking to you. So I understand your point that you always feel comfortable talking to your data, but your data may be talking to you in a language that you don't understand. The data has to understand your language. They, has, they have to understand your context. It's like if you have a very um, sophisticated expert talking to someone operating a machinery, but that someone does not understand the lingo of what you are providing them. You have to put yourself in the shoes of that person and see, okay, this is what you need. I understand now the type of indicators you have. And this is what I mean by the sense-making process. And this is what I mean by the learning design driving the data. The learning design stipulates the structure of the activities, which one is connected to which, which one is more or less relevant. Let me give you another example. When you detect repeated engagement with videos, uh, you might detect repeated engagement with videos for certain students. Um, you have to probably bear in mind that certain students might not uh, understand the video perfectly. Some students may not speak the language of that uh, video and it's not their first language. Those are all variables and contextual information that needs to be laid on top of the data. It needs to, used, to be used to modulate how the data speaks to you. So that's the trade-off that specifically in learning, it's very important. Um, the final point I want to make about that answer is that we tend to have a lot of inertia and a lot of baggage from the already existing use of data. If you're browsing in Amazon and you're buying books and Amazon puts the suggestion below and the book that is suggesting is totally relevant to you, the cost of failure is still, is nothing. It doesn't matter because you will have 1 million people browsing through your Amazon shop, uh, Amazon bookshop. And sooner or later, some of those recommendations will be effective and you can afford that type of context. In learning, it is different. We don't work under that assumption. We cannot prescribe uh, students some suggestions and then it's like, yeah, it's not relevant, who cares? It's much more contextualized, it's much more delicate, that, that interaction. We cannot afford the luxury of having, I don't know, 40, 60% of the recommendations we provide to students being not necessary or inaccurate or inappropriate. And that's why we need to increase the amount of context we bring into the picture. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Then there's a question from Ms. Kanoponen. Uh, what chance do we have against China, who has a much, much bigger budget? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, chance of what and against uh, seems to... Is that seems China? To... This is Chinese. Uh, how do you see a Chinese uh, learning analytics uh, in, in general, uh, the situation of learning analytics in China? I think... It, the big advantage of the, of the good news is that learning analytics is, it's an area that is very contextual, it's very contextualized. So China has its, its own education system. They, I'm sure they are using analytics techniques, um, which is fine. Um, I'm sure they're advancing the field. But at the same time, if you're thinking under the lens of the Finnish education system, uh, there might be some special things that need to be considered. Um, the type of learning experiences here are very contextualized. I'm sure there is a learning experience that is very difficult, different in Finland than in China. So I, I don't see itself like a, a being one against other. Um, if there are advances and innovations happening in China that uh, researchers can consider and perhaps you know are relevant for the context, then why not? And vice versa. So I think my answer to that question is, yep, there is potential. There is a lot of interest. There, is, there are a lot of ideas. So be open to, to see what is happening in other places, but also be mindful that there is a certain amount of contextualization that needs to be done. All right, thank you. Uh, then uh, the final question we have in the Q&A is about uh, uh, research ethics and, and consent, student consent. So, it's a rather long question, yes. Uh, research ethics usually requires that you collect informed consent from the participants and that you declare 
for what purposes data will be used. Now, if we retrieve data uh, about previous education and then collect and combine data throughout the student's higher education studies, how does this comply to research ethics? And when does the student submit his consent and how can the student cancel his consent? Okay, this is, this is a very good question. And um, one way that I would approach the answer is the following. We need to separate two things. One is the collection of data within the context of a learning experience for the purpose of improving that learning experience. And a very different one is research, performing research on that data. Okay, those are two different chapters, completely, completely different. Now, if we remain on the research angle, we need to put in place protocols, and there are pretty much all over in, in the institution that I've been interacting with, similar to the ones in the medical domain for research, which is, if you plan to run an experiment, you need to tell your students, these are the type of data that I'm capturing. You need to uh, comply with the legislation if it is personal data you are capturing. And, um, and this is the type of uh, protocol we follow, for example, for the publications I showed you. Um, the focus groups that we run with our students, uh, this is something that uh, we give them the description of the study. We tell them who is responsible. We tell them the purpose. We'll tell them what is it going to be about? We also tell them uh, how the data is going to be captured, manipulated, stored. We also give them the possibility and inform them that they can drop at any time with no explanation or nothing. And if they understand that and they agree, then um, we proceed. And if not, um, they are not participating in those focus groups. So I think um, we need to be very aware that as soon as we step into the research domain, we need to comply with all the legislation and with all the requirements. And, and this is something that, as far as I can tell, the, the area is advancing in that direction. All right, that was the final questions. Thank you, Abelardo, for your keynote and your answers to these questions. And now uh, we'll move on to, we had a uh, mix up in the beginning. We had a presentation from uh, Yuvaskula also, but we weren't sure about connections. So now we're trying to get uh, Yuvaskula in central Finland uh, on board. Let's see if, if we can make this happen for them to share the situation with learning analytics research. And then move on to my final presentation. Let's see. So we have uh, Central uh -huh. Finland on board. Okay. And I'll put uh, uh, your slides from here. <coughs> okay, hello everybody. Uh, nice to <laughs> be able to join here and thank you for all the very nice and, and useful information. Uh, up to now. So my name is Tommy Kerkan and I'm professor of uh, mathematical information technology in the Faculty of Information Technology here at the University of Jyväskylä and uh, I've been a principal professor of teacher education study line around 20 years now and, and uh, we have also in the faculty currently the research area on learning and cognitive sciences which I'm heading. So uh, in this respect uh, my research group was recently rebranded and we call ourselves now Humble, Human and Machine-Based Intelligence in Learning. And uh, both us and, and learning analytics here in Uvascula have a very strong role, especially inside the university, to enhance the educational arrangements in general and to strengthen our role as internationally recognized research university on, on, on teaching and learning. So there will be some details given in the slides. Uh, for me, the work on learning analytics actually started more than 20 years ago, even before this term was uh, introduced. So, uh, because uh, I see learning analytics, which is the creation of reliable, flexible, uh, the main part of, of LA uh, to compose of reliable, flexible and scalable models or patterns or representations of this educational data. And, and this is something that uh, um, links really this machine learning, data mining, pattern recognition, computational intelligence, data science, whatever you call it, to, to uh, processing these educational data. And it goes, as Professor Pardo said, beyond the statistical models and tests or uh, use of uh, simple dashboards. 
Uh, and of course, this representation should be interpreted in the lingo of uh, learning and learning design. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, some depictions of uh, our uh, long-lasting research on both the methods and their applications is, is uh, summarized in the slides with some <clears throat> publications there. Uh, and actually, a particular recent activity to combine an educational theory, validated scale, and robust learning analytics is also summarized in, in the second slide there, where we deal with student agency analytics. And, and this is something that, that at least our group sees as a very fruitful combination, which uh, can be links to, to uh, uh, tutoring guidance uh, and uh, uh, improvement of uh, understanding of learning and learning and late arrangements on, on uh, an uh, institutional scale. Uh, to this end, there have been many PhD theses here in Jyväskylä on computing education and educational technology. And uh, currently, there are many in progress actually related to some of the projects which were already mentioned in this, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. And let's move on to our final presentation, which is my presentation about uh, Finland in global uh, learning analytics community. So uh, I'm having uh, three, three uh, topics here. First, uh, networks and events, then EU projects, and then collabor collaborative software development, and how Finland is uh, integrated to, to the international learning analytics community. These are only, I have only exp examples of few events and few projects, but uh, I think they're more than, enough, more than enough here. So, for example, this Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference uh, hosted by SOLAR, Society of Learning Analytics Research, uh, we've had quite a few attendees and submissions from Finland uh, in the last few years. We have one keynote speaker at LAC 17, Sanna Järvela from Oulu, but uh, apart from that, only a few people attending. So what I'd like to see is that you all, or at least a part of you, would attend the LAC20 in Frankfurt and also submit something to the LAC20 uh, conference. And you can find the link to the conference there. So uh, if our participation in the Global uh, Learning Analytics Conference is, is quite low, maybe we are more active in the Nordic uh, sector. So Nordic Learning Analytics Summer Institute, LASI Nordic has been arranged uh, two times and third time this year. But no, we have also very low attendance there. So only uh, two attendees last year and one of them was uh, Sanna Järvela again from Oulu uh, as a keynote speaker and no attendees in the first LASI Nordic. So I would encourage you to attend and uh, send your submissions to Lassi Nordic 19, which will be in Tallinn in August. You can find that through, through the link there. Then about the EU projects, there have, has been quite a few learning analysts themed EU projects and I think the first one was uh, this LACE project, Learning Analytics Community Exchange, hosted by the Open University in the Netherlands and uh, with the multiple partners and multiple associate partners. Uh, Finland was uh, an associate partner with, with University of Oulu uh, led group uh, in, in this project, but no other universities from Finland were participating in this program. Uh, then there was this uh, STELLA project, uh, successful transformation from secondary to higher education using learning analytics, where the goal was to enhance the successful transition uh, to higher education with the help of learning analytics and uh, develop, test and assess learning analytics uh, uh, approaches and providing formative and summative feedback to students in transition. Uh, there were universities from Belgium and the United Kingdom and Netherlands, but again, no Finnish 
universities involved. Then a Sheila project uh, supporting higher education to integrate learning analytics. This was like an uh, institutional adoption project of, of learning analytics uh, to assist European universities to become more mature users and custodians of digital data about their students as they learn online. Again, there were uh, the coordinating body was from Belgium and there were partners from Belgium, Estonia, uh, Netherlands and Spain and also associate partners from all over Europe except Finland. <laughs> See the pattern. Then there has uh, currently ongoing. There's this learning analytics in Latin America project. There we have uh, universities from Spain, Chile, Colombia, UK, Belgium, but no Finland. So this is a kind of a wake-up call to us all in Finland. We should be more active regarding these international projects. So let's connect with European universities active in learning analytics and get involved in future EU projects. That's my suggestion. Also, uh, this theme of collaborative software development. So Finland has long and successful history of open source software development. For example, Linux and Git are, are Finnish innovations. And open source uh, software development and learning analytics fit together perfectly. So uh, with open source software, we, ha we have transparent models and algorithms. We can do open collaboration and agile development, and it's, it's, it can be very cost efficient. So I would encourage all uh, software developers in their area to, to work with uh, global pro projects they are regarding learning analytics. And one example, is this uh, on-task learning that was handled in Abelardo's keynote. So you can find the whole software in GitHub and, and download it onto your computer and, and test it and, and start developing if you want. And also, as mentioned, Finnish translation is available. Uh, I translated in, in, in the spring and have been trying to get be up with the updates to pro provide you the Finnish translation also on the news version. And if you're interested in the software, you, you can uh, contact Apple to have the access to the demo service. But if you are interested to get support inside Finland, you can contact me and, and I'll get you started with on tasks. So uh, as a summary, let's attend international learning analytics events. Let's get involved in international learning analytics projects. Let's do collaborative learning analytics software development. And let's stop being isolated from global learning analytics community. <laughs> it's a bold statement, but I, I think uh, it needs to be done here. So, and if you want, you can contact me in research collaboration, get it started with OnTask or simply getting coffee, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. You presented quite a challenge for all of us. So, uh, I think we're heading to the end of the, uh, this webinar, and I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Abelard Riparo. Thanks for having such a great keynote and, and the Q&A. Uh, thanks to CSC uh, for hosting us in this uh, platform and providing the practical arrangements around this webinar. And thanks for our guest speakers from uh, Jyväskylä and Tampere. And here are some next steps that uh, Anu will present to us. So, yes. So uh, there will be a few national events uh, for learning analytics interests to collaborate and meet. Uh, there will be CSC organized learning analytics workshop uh, in on May few in few weeks. Also, there will be this learning analytics network meeting in Pedaforum Room in the beginning of June. And of course, uh, the Nordic Learning Analytics Summer Institute that Jonas mentioned in his presentation. Uh, so we hope that the discussion of learning analytics will, dis will continue uh, at the following events. And we wish to meet there as many 
learning analytics researchers and developers and, as possible. And just a quick reminder that this uh, webinar was recorded and the recording will be available in about a week. So you can share the recording with your colleagues that couldn't attend us this morning. All right, thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.